Greetings from Ann Arbor, Michigan, a great state and a great place of the great USA. Welcome to our podcast series, and I am promising you that this series is going to be very enlightening, very inspirational, a lot of fun, and something that will really, I think, help you as you walk your path to holiness. This series is going to have a lot of different things that you probably have questions about, but maybe have the opportunity to ask, especially about religion just life. Like, what do they do all day? Who are they? Where do they come from? What's it like when a young woman enters religious life? So stay tuned as we will discuss where sisters come from today. Welcome back to The Truth Will Set You Free. I am Sister Joseph Andrew Bogdanowitz, the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And today we are going to zero in on just what does it mean to be a Dominican? Who are the Dominicans? Have you ever seen Dominicans? Are there men and women in the Dominicans, or is it just the Dominican sisters, and are they only in Ann Arbor, Michigan? I can assure you the Dominican spirituality comprises the world in so many ways. It comprises both priests and sisters and brothers, religious brothers, and contemplative nuns, and you, the laity as well. The Dominican family is universal, and we are spread all over the globe. Over 800 years ago, 802 years ago, actually, there was a young man who was on his way to becoming a priest, and he actually lived in Spain. And in, if you think of the world at that time, the feudal system and um, the way that the world was mapped out at that particular time, we have this young man who went with his bishop and made many travels. I'm simplifying this to point out that he knew early on that he wanted his vocation to be such that he would give himself entirely to God as a priest. The name of this man, Dominic de Guzman. He came from a very religious family. His mother has been beatified. One Blessed Jane, one of his brothers has been beatified, Blessed Manes, and then another brother also became a priest. So you have this religious family producing this young man. As he is on travels, he's beginning to realize that a lot of people are, do not know their faith, and yet they're supposed to be Catholics. And so he found great sorrow in his heart from this ignorance that came from so many people who were professing the faith, perhaps, or had lapsed from the faith, had fallen away from the faith. And in reality, it was obvious that they really did not know the truth, the name of these podcasts, the truth. They did not know the truth. And part of this was because they weren't really given the best examples of people in the church who lived the truth to its fullness. And Dominic's heart was very tender, and he saw this, and he was a very intelligent young man. He made the decision that he would allow God to use him once he became a priest, even more so in regards to the passion God put in his heart, the passion for veritas. In the Latin, that means for truth. Dominic went around his known part of the world professing the truth. There was a heresy at this point in time, 800 years ago, which really was older, is much older than 800 years. Even St. Augustine's time in the 4th and 5th centuries, he talks about this same heresy, the Albigensian heresy, the heresy that really undermined and tried to um, condemn the fleshy part of our existence. And we might say, why would they do that? Well, in reality, I think I could say that we can see some of this coming up in today's world. Do we really appreciate all life? Do we appreciate human life in the sense of the child in the womb? Do we appreciate life if we know that this life is already compromised when even in the womb due to ultrasound and other wonderful things that we have today? Do we really appreciate that this child is probably going to be Down syndrome, and yet 
we will love this child and this child will grow through our love and nourishment after birth into whatever age the good God has destined for this particular individual. Or do we very readily say, this person is not worth the effort this person will take? Is that not one of the saddest statements? It's a very Albigensian, heretical, wrong teaching, wrong belief, wrong everything way of thinking. And Dominic's age had this creeping into it. Again, this wasn't the first time, but it seemed to rise up again in this particular moment of of our history in the 1200s and the 1300s. And so Dominic seeing this and realizing how beautiful and freeing is the true faith, his heart was set aflame to go out there and to preach and teach to others the truth that would set them free. The truth will set us free. Dominic soon gathered friars around him, other young men who had this similar passion, and they would come to him, and he obviously was a charismatic figure. He had a great deal of joy. He had a great depth. He had a singular type personality that drew others to him, and he was a leader. And so he began to think, what would it be like if I found another order in the church? At that precise time in church history, the Holy Father, rightfully so, because what he speaks, he is is influenced by the Holy Spirit, and he had seen things happen in the church by which he had decided to say no more new rules in the church. Now, Dominic wanted to found his order with the motto of Veritas, or truth. So he travels to Rome to ask a special permission to be able to found this new family within the church. Interestingly, while he is there, it appears he met this young man, another young um, brother, actually, who had traveled, religious brother, who had traveled there with a similar decision made in his heart to found another order. His would not be based on truth, teaching and preaching the truth, but instead his would be based on lady poverty. So the legend, which is pretty strong, says that St. Francis and St. Dominic both met in Rome, both of them seeking the unusual permission from the Holy Father to begin another religious spirituality, we say, order is the proper term, in the heart of the church. Both receive permission. Dominic always wanted the friars who would follow him to actually be on fire with truth. Again, the motto of the podcast, the truth will set you free. The freedom that God has created each of us to live and to know inside our hearts. And Dominic being very intellectual and seeing really the fact that a lack of truth puts us in an interior prison. It not only separates us from others, it separates from us from God, and it separates us from ourselves. And so no one flourishes without the truth. Dominic, first of all, and this I really do enjoy, perhaps he was such a brilliant man, he knew really the strength of women. But also, I believe the Holy Spirit influenced this because he was asked to take this community of religious women who had fallen away from their pristine and their more correct obedience to their particular way of living religious life and to beef it up again, to reform it. The story goes on in very much history that's, that's delightful to read, and I can only imagine the reality of being a part of it. But he does this in such a manner that we women Dominicans like to say that we were founded before the men Dominicans were. And that is true, even if the men don't quite agree with this, because he founded the women first. And I would say that's because the Holy Spirit knew those men were going to need the women's prayers. And so we hold them to the fire on truth. However, they are really our brothers, because in the orders in the church, the orders are the older groups of communities and the, the spiritualities. So we have the Dominic, we have the Benedictines, 
We have the Carmelites. We have the Dominicans, the Franciscans. We have the Augustinians. And then coming out of those, eventually, the God gives the world St. Ignatius of Loyola, who begins his Society of Jesus, named after Jesus himself, and we commonly call them the Jesuits. And at that point, some of the... Um, the monastery ways kind of are put to the side, and he began saying, your monastery is everywhere in the world that you go. Now, we Dominicans would certainly not criticize that, but we would say our older tradition really does say that we need our time in the chapel, in the monastery, and we go out from there. So there's a difference there. They're both beautiful. They're both ordained by God, but we're called to different aspects of the truth when we look at the various spiritualities. So what is it the Dominican spirituality really asks of us and has given us? First of all, think of 800 years of church history. That's a lot that the world has gone through. And everywhere there has been a crisis and everywhere there has been a need, there have been Dominicans rising to the fore to lead others in the way of truth. Think of how I just mentioned the, the term imprisoned we are when we don't have the truth, and yet how many people live inside a prison, so to speak, in their spirit, because they don't have the truth, or they don't seek to know the truth, or they don't spend time necessary to really learn the various aspects. And if they don't, they're denying themselves the ability to see God as clearly face-to-face -face as he might want to reveal himself to us. Because remember, God is truth. God is love. Love is truth. True love truly is true. So if we go back to Dominic and his passion for Veritas, for setting the world on fire, you will notice with his statues, he tends to have, he's at the, he's standing with a torch in his hand, the torch of truth, Veritas. There is also at his feet, and many times the dog has the torch rather than Dominic. Dominic might be carrying the book, the books of the gospel, in particular the gospel of St. Matthew and the epistles of St. Paul. But the dog at the feet of Dominic has a torch in its mouth, and it is seen encircling the globe with the torch of truth. That was Dominic's desire. And actually, when Dominic's mother, St. Blessed Jane, was pregnant with Dominic. She had a vision of this particular uh, icon, so to speak, of her son, which was the dog, Dominus dog, going around the world with the torch of truth. So that's become a symbol for Dominic. Dominic had that desire. One of the best quotes of the Dominican order uh, through St. Thomas Aquinas and many other saints, will always be that we, as Dominicans, contemplate and bring to others the fruits of our contemplation. I want to really highlight that because, as I mentioned uh, in the podcast when we were referring to what is our common day like, we begin with prayer. As Dominicans, everything we do begins in the sanctuary, so to speak. It begins in deep prayer. And from that, we flow out to the world. And that prayer, which is so essential to us, gives us the words, the inspiration, the the love necessary, sometimes the patience, sometimes the repetition, sometimes um, different verbiage, and sometimes the self-sacrifice needed to convert others back to God because we come from God. So to stray away from Him really is to walk very directly in the wrong direction against Him into darkness and away from the truth, the light, the way, who is Christ himself. So if we think of Dominic, that's his desire, that we would begin in prayer, and then we would go out and teach. And so we teach all over the world. And again, going back to church history, 800 years of saints. We have St. Dominic. We have St. Thomas Aquinas. We have Pier Giorgio Frassati in the last 100 years. We have many Dominican saints and blesseds. We have many women saints and blesseds. We have St. Catherine de Ricci, St. Rose of Lima, St. Catherine of Siena. And again, the spirituality goes on and on. And not everyone, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, not everyone wore the Dominican 
habit in their day-to-day life because not everyone was had home base, so to speak, in a monastery of some kind, like we do. Some are laity, and they become lay Dominicans with the vows And then they go out and preach and teach in the world of their family and their apostolate and their workplace and whatever they do. So it's something to consider whether you could consecrate your life to God even beyond perhaps your marriage or your missionary work or whatever it is that is consuming your time and energies. And you could consecrate all that, that much more as a Dominican layperson. And certainly there are countless numbers of these throughout the world. As we continue with the Dominican spirituality, I want to certainly highlight the fact that Dominican spirituality is incarnational. Now, what does that mean? That is, to me, very beautiful and very freeing. It basically means when God created us, he didn't create us as spirits or souls walking around or, so to speak, existing on earth and flying through the air like an angel. We're not angels. We have a flesh and blood reality unique to each one of us called our bodies. That is the incarnational aspect. And again, the Albigensians didn't like that. They thought that the body was wrong. They thought that the body was evil. They did not like when two people got married, let alone when they brought new life into the world. The Albigensians, what Dominic fought, was against new life. Does that not have some rings of our common contemporary culture? We know these things are still present today, and they will be because they somehow remain in the weakness of the human nature. Ultimately, that without God's grace or an openness to his grace and to truth, we can be very, very selfish. I'm the only one that counts. Snuff out everyone else. Just pay attention to me. So there is that reality, and Dominic loved the fact of the incarnation that God himself, the three persons in one, God, the second person, the Son, came to earth and chose to come to earth in flesh and blood reality. He elevated the dignity of the entire human person. He elevated the fact that we have these bodies and they're met by God. And the theology of the body, John Paul II, calls them like a sacramental, whereby it is something that we use to bring God to others. If you couldn't see me, why would you be watching this? If you couldn't hear me, why would you be listening? How do I do this? With a body. I don't just think and expect you to understand it on the opposite side of this. We use our bodies as communicators. Dominicans should be excellent communicators. There is a lot to communicate when the communication centers in Scripture, centers on the Word. The Word made flesh in the womb of a woman, Mother Mary. So the incarnational aspect highlights the dignity of the human person and the reason it is so important to be pro-life, because otherwise, what do we have? We have nothing. So the essence of this really is to look at another person and to say, this other person, like myself, this other person is another Christ. Or in the case of a woman, this is another Mary. She is walking the earth today through this woman. Christ is walking the earth today through you men. We need to raise the dignity of both the feminine and the masculine genius. Now I'm going to go into Mary. Again, Mary will be highlighted in these podcasts many, many times because we love Mary. How could we not? Um, As women, she's our model, and we want to be like her. And you men... She's the completion of your desires, of your heart, that perfect woman. Your wife may be many completions, but she's not going to probably be perfect, sorry to say, even if she's great. But we can think of Mary, every one of us, and say, oh my gosh, how she lifts me up. Oh my gosh, what was it like for 30 years to take care of Jesus? You know, we have that paternal and maternal aspect that says how precious children are. And yet as they grow up, do we still maintain that I love that? that person, and I would give my life for that person. Mary did that. She stood under that cross of her son and would have gladly been crucified in his place, but that was not the Father's will. But she was crucified with him, and so we have the seven sorrows of the heart of Mary. And for us women, Mary is our model. Her spiritual motherhood inspires our spiritual motherhood. 
And so she is why we are Dominican Sisters of Mary, who is mother, and we highlight those. And also the Eucharist, again, another aspect of our faith that we cannot put on a high enough apex to say this is the source and summit of the Christian life, of our spiritual lives, as the Vatican, as the Constitution. Catholic Catechism actually states. The Catholic Catechism states that the Eucharist is the source and summit, meaning we go to Jesus even through Jesus when we receive him in the Eucharist and how important that is. And so a life without the Eucharist, or we could say a world without the Eucharist, would eventually become quickly, a very lonely world. We need the heart of Christ beating inside all of us, and we need to love Christ. Another aspect of the Dominican spirituality, which is very important, is liturgical. Again, when we discussed in another podcast the, our, our commonality of our days, did you notice how many times we stop what we're doing to go to the chapel and pray part of the divine office? Why? Because the Mass is the supreme act of sacrifice of Christ on the cross, every single Holy Mass, which is celebrated throughout the world constantly somewhere because of the different time zones and everything else. And I love to think of that when I wake up in the middle of the night, wherever you are, Jesus, and the the priest is saying, this is my body over the host, and this is my blood over the precious wine. I want to be there too, mystically. And we know the mystical body of Christ is present in every Mass. So as we look at that, we say, what can flow out of there when I leave the church? We have the liturgical life of the church to lead us. We have many sacramentals and devotions, too. We certainly have the rosary, another very strong to Jesus through Mary prayer. But we also have the divine office. This is basically a summary of the Psalms of King David, the Psalms that are in every single Bible, the Psalms by which mankind for thousands of years has prayed to give himself back to God. He hasn't always prayed with intense joy necessarily. I love the Psalms. They're very real. They're very truthful. He's prayed with anger sometimes. He's gotten mad at God. God, why do you not seem to see me? Why do you afflict me with this? Why do you not help me when I'm asking? Again, all this is paraphrased, but if you read the Psalms, every emotion you can possibly have is in there somewhere. You're not the only one experiencing some of this. And I think that's comforting for how many thousands of years since the beginning of mankind. God has put these things into our hearts, strengths, and I like to say challenges, because by challenges accepted, we will become great. We will become strong. And if the challenge is out there, the, depending on the way we accept it, we become holy or we bring ourselves further away from God. So there is a truth at this. And to sum it up, I would just have to say that the Dominican spirituality fits me perfectly. I like the true. I like the real. I like the incarnational aspect. I'm grateful that God gave me a body. I hope that I can use it well, that I can use it to glorify him. I'm grateful for the fact he's given us the Eucharist and we can receive him in Holy Communion. How could I exist without Mother Mary to lead me? How would I know my spiritual motherhood on every single child that I could ever teach? The Dominican spirituality is out there for everyone. As we mentioned, there's probably more laity in the Dominican spirituality than there certainly are our priests, brothers, sisters, and contemplative nuns. And yet each aspect of those highlights the fact that we are all in this together. And the beauty of the Dominican spirituality will shine like the stars for all eternity. Because I think God really blessed our fa- father, Dominic, with an incredible desire for holiness that would shine throughout all the ages. And the Dominicans have so many saints in heaven that are praying and pushing and pulling us throughout our lives. So let us thank God for this beautiful spirituality. And as we sum it up, 
Let us remember to really pray for all priests and all religious, as we do for you, married people also, because we need your prayers too, and pray that our family of the Dominican spirituality and the other beautiful families in the church, and there are many, and you will meet many more in these podcasts, that they too will grow, because for the family of the universal church to be healthy, it needs its holy fathers and priests holy mothers and women religious, and holy children and all the laity that will come together, and the laity that through the beautiful sacrament of marriage will bring us more children into this beautiful world for God. On behalf of Lumen Ecclesia Digital, or as we say, LE Digital, thank you for listening to this segment of The Truth Will Set You Free. God bless you and see you again next time. So if you like the material on this particular podcast, then please click on the next podcast for another fascinating story.